everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're just waiting for a few more to join uh, before we start today's uh, International Women's Day. Um, it's an absolute privilege to um, be chairing this. And also, uh, I'd like to introduce okay. Stephanie oh, wow. Unthank. Um, if, sorry, if I could ask, that's it, perfect, thank you. Um, so yes, we've got Stephanie Unthank here from Infinity Wellness. Um, and it's a really, it's going to be a really um, collaborative event. So yeah, we really want your participation in this. Um, so I, I'm just gonna let you know exactly what today looks like. So. Um, we're going to obviously introduce Stephanie. We're then going to go into a Q&A session with Stephanie. Um, we're then going to go into some breakout rooms so you can all do what you do best, which is introducing yourselves and um, sharing you know, your strengths uh, within, within the breakout room. Uh, we're then going to go into another breakout room. Um, so we're going to have three. So basically this morning, so International Women's Day, it's great to have so many women on here and also men, because without men, we, we cannot uh, move the bias forward. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what is International uh, Women's Day and what that represents. So bear with me a moment, sorry, my screen. So International Women's Day 2022. Imagine a gender equal world, a world free of bias, stereotypes and discrimination, a world that's diverse, equitable and inclusive, a world where difference is valued and celebrated. Together we can forge women's equality, collective we can all break the bias. So on that note, thank you ever so much for attending uh, and I will hand over now to Steph. Thank you very much, Kelly. Morning, everybody. And uh, yeah, I just want to echo what um, Kelly said. It's an absolute privilege for me to be here today. I'm really, um, yeah, really chuffed, actually. I'm very proud to have been asked to um, come along and speak for this session. Um, it's a day that um, there's always a lot of um, dialogue and hype around it. And uh, in the work that I do, particularly in the wellbeing space, I do get involved in quite a lot of discussions leading up to the 8th of March every year. So I'm just really pleased that I could be here with you guys. And um, as Kelly said, it's so nice to have uh, a mixture of men and women on this session. Um, so look, before I even get into who I am and what I'm all about, which I won't bore you for, for too long with, I want to just share a few stats with you. Um, and these are around sort of breaking the bias stats. So currently women hold 31% of senior roles in the UK. So senior leadership roles where they're essentially sitting on a board of directors or an executive committee. And then I looked elsewhere globally and India, I think, have got um, interesting stats. I mean, 35% of the workforce in India is made up of women and 85% of women have missed out on opportunities due to their gender. And then when we look at the comparison, compared to men at their level, women leaders are up to twice as likely to spend a substantial amount of time on diversity, equity and inclusion work that interestingly and importantly is seen as falling outside of their formal job responsibilities. So what I mean by that is that this is side of desk work. So I go into work as a woman, I'm doing an eight till five, eight till six job. And that job has objectives, it has a role, it has responsibilities, it has a job description, but anything to do with diversity, equity and inclusion sits outside of that work. And I do that on the side of my desk, stretching my day, maybe moving into my evenings and actually taking up my weekends. Women are also more likely than men to take allyship actions, such as mentoring women of colour, advocating for new opportunities for them and actively confronting discrimination. And, and that details come from McKinsey and Co and livepure.com. The gap though is also widening. And I find this really interesting um, because there's a sense I think from many that the gap isn't widening and that things are getting better. But actually the statistics and the reports and the research that we're seeing is not proving that. So women are more burnt out than a year ago. And obviously some of that will be due to COVID. And the gap between women and men is widening. So it might feel like it's not. It might feel like everything that we're doing, like being here today, talking about this agenda, getting involved in the discussion and the dialogue and supporting one another. It feels like we're moving in the right direction. But the stats, the research and the evidence don't prove that. So 2020, 28 percent, moving up to 35 percent in 2021 of men are always or almost always burnt out. So there's a there's a specific uh, statistic there around men, 
but 32% in 2020 up to 42% in 2021 is women are always or almost always burnt out. So you can see number one, there is growth in both the sexes, but also the gap between women and men is widening. And this increases to over 50% for women that are leading teams in an executive position. So one in three women are considering downshifting their career or leaving the workplace, one in three. In 2020, that was one in four. And then women in senior, women senior leaders have done 60% more to provide emotional support to employees. So 60% more, and that's about being active in that space. So 60% more in terms of emotional support. This is what um, I'll refer to later, later as emotional labor, both in and outside the work, workplace. So yeah, so look, let me just introduce myself and just start by saying hello and a bit about me. So um, a little bit of my past is I, I did 18 years in um, corporate global banking in a corporate landscape, and I left that behind in 2017. And then I requalified as a, a wellbeing professional. I major, and what I call major, so this is where the, most of my time is spent on mental and emotional wellbeing, modernizing, and this is the really important part for me, modernizing mindfulness and making it relatable and accessible in this modern society that we live in. And then thirdly, the thing that I'm really passionate about as well is wellbeing culture at organizational level. So this is about the change landscape and helping organizations to embed wellbeing into the culture of their organization. Now, my work is based on um, two words, educate and empower. OK, so this is about how do I support other people to understand that um, the effects on their whole human condition, i.e. their their physical being, their mental well-being, their emotional well-being have a huge impact in terms of their ability to show up and be the best version of themselves. So that's why when I look at well-being, I look at it from a very rounded place. I look at it from a perspective of cultural change and I am a huge advocate of modernizing mindfulness. Um, I've been in the mindfulness space for a long time and I'm a um, regulated registered teacher in that space as well. So it probably feels like to you that I do veer away quite a lot from more traditional, let's say, well-being initiatives. So I'm not the type of person that would kind of rock up normally to um, an organization and do a one hour thing, a one hour skit and then kind of leave. What I try to do is engage organisations in the longer term dynamic of well-being and how that can really help to shift the dial on a number of different uh, measures from an employee and also from a leadership perspective. You know, um, if I think about um, the things that I guess uh, drive me, um, I work with all types of companies everywhere. And I really mean that. So it's I can work with a company that's got 30 employees or 20 employees right through to um, a contract that I've just taken on, which is a, an, a, a, um, a, a national contract of a company that's got 14 different sites, has got about 3,000 employees, and that's going to be a three-year piece of work. So, you know, it really does span from, you know, really small companies with five or six employees right through to some of the kind of bigger corporates. Normally spending time in that space under the FTSE 100, 200 radar. Um, and as I said, just this modern approach to mindfulness for individuals, I do still do a huge amount of individual work um, and uh, relational based work and also work in, for mindfulness with groups, small groups and in uh, organisational level. And my passion is to do that through partnership and collaboration. So um, and what I mean by that is I like to pay it forward. So I like to work with people and bring other people in that I can trust to stand side by side with me and offer them opportunities to work together to create partnerships and collaborate. So that's a bit about me and the business, which is Infinity Wellness with Stephanie Unthank. And soon you'll see some stuff happening around Infinity Mindfulness with Stephanie Unthank and Associates. So look out for that too. So um, what I'm bringing to you today is a little bit of a story of my past in terms of this breaking the bias and how that fits in with um, the theme of International Women's Day, um, and also um, how I've moved from that place in the past to where I am today, which is um, leading this uh, company that is evolving and shaping, and I'll tell you later on a bit more about that, and how that story is unfolded. So um, I thought it'd be really helpful just to paint a bit of a picture of um, what's gone on for me. Um, you know, over the past, <laughs> without it being too long, but over the past sort of 25 years. So I'll keep it quite short and I won't, hopefully won't bore you too much. But the things I wanted to talk to you about in terms of this relation to breaking the bias, the first thing 
is that, as I said, I worked in this corporate global banking space for 17, 18 years. And what comes with that are a number of hurdles and challenges. And some of these, I'm sure, are going to be really familiar to some of you that are listening today. So the hurdles, the challenges, the desire for me to move up that career ladder really early on, I started in that organisation when I was 25, um, were driven, really driven by um, a couple of things. Predominantly was increased income, because at that age, it was really important for me to try to earn more money in order that I could get on the property ladder, um, in order that I could make a life for myself. But it was also driven by opportunity, wanting more responsibility, uh, personal development, wanting to develop myself, look for variation in roles, make a bit of a name for myself and build a bit of a reputation. But what came with that was um, a quite a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, um, a lot of developing anxieties. It also brought, um, I think, like a, a, a work hard mentality that was quite unhealthy. So long hours. Um, I was at work more than I was at home, increased drinking of alcohol, poor diet, lack of sleep, and maybe even an effect on relationships, so breakdowns in relationships. And I don't necessarily mean just partners, but when I look at that wider relationships with family and friends, you know, what did I give up in order to try to be all of those things in that workplace? So, but there were times when I really believed, and I'm sure that I did enjoy it. You know, those 17, 18 years, there were times that I really did believe, but I'm sure that I did enjoy it. Now, some of the people that I worked with were amazing and some weren't so great. And I felt really, really fortunate, though, that um, I was often asked if I would apply for certain jobs that came up at certain times. So I had that kind of pat on the shoulder. You know, you're really good at what you do. You've got a really good reputation. Do you want to come and do this job? The flattery of that really swept me along the way. And those consistent promotions and pay increases I always knew the type of work that I was going to be getting into, but never, ever did I even question the type of people that I would be signing up to in terms of their values, their integrity, um, what they brought to the workplace. So that was a real challenge for me in those early days. I didn't do enough research on that. And the leaders that I came up against, the managers that I came up against, um, they obviously for us now, they make such a difference, don't they? The people that we work with, they have such an influence on us. Um, so I look back on that and I think you know, there's, there's nothing that I would change because I can't and I don't live in that space of trying to change the past. But I do realise how that shaped um, maybe the role and the parts that I played in that organisation. And it was towards the latter stages of my career between 2010, 2017, that I worked for some really challenging people. Uh, my behaviour changed. I became extremely subservient, extremely subservient, allowing myself to be treated in certain ways, to be spoken to in certain ways due to, I guess, the hierarchy and the system that was in place. And I'm going to be really honest with you. The people that I'm referring to were men, OK? There was one time in those seven, seven years between 2010 and 2017 where I did have a woman as a boss and we got on really well, we had an understanding, we were honest, we were open, we were dynamic, we got the job done, we made things happen together. Now that didn't come without its challenges, of course it came with its challenges, two strong women in a place of senior authority, so there's, there's going to be a rub, right? But um, I just want it to be known, I do get on with men really, really well. <laughs> so I just want to put that out there. I've got loads of male friends. Um, I've got lots of male uh, contacts in my circle, and in my networking group, and I'm not a feminist. But this story I'm telling you is about the past and how the past has shaped my future. I'm really balanced when it comes to gender views, and I really believe in equanimity. So that equitableness in terms of the way that we conduct ourselves and we balance that um, that, that way of working together in a really equitable way. Um, so this was never a male, female thing for me. It was never a male, female thing. But I do remember making some really awful decisions under the leadership of those people. Um, and each time the decisions were being related to being told to do something by a dominant male figure. So when I look back on some of those times, I actually can't quite believe some of it. So for instance, and I'll give you a few stories, um, I was told to give feedback to a senior female colleague that I didn't believe, but I still did it whilst he stood over me and watched me do it, almost feeling like he was mocking me from the background. Um, there was another time where I laughed off a sexual invitation that was made to be by, made to be by another uh, male boss. It was pretty gross, actually, and it was pretty up close and personal. 
And then there was another time where I allowed myself and my whole team to be rated as underperforming one year, even though I'd come into that job with three months left of that financial year. And there is no way in this world I could have turned that performance around. So this is what I mean about subservience, right? So really kind of bowing down and not breaking that bias. You know, I can honestly sit here and say, I didn't stick up for myself. I allowed these people to kind of make me feel this certain way. Um, and when I look back on that now, I, I don't look back at it with anger. With anger, I don't look back at it with sadness. Um, what I do look back on it as is a place of learning, a place of understanding, a place of growth. And that's because I've learned to accept it and move on from that place. And that's why I'm going to come to talking about mindfulness to you later on. So and then I want to talk about the stories that we tell ourselves. Right. So and this I know this will be familiar with so many of us. I told myself that this was normal. These relationships, this subservience, this feeling like I had to fall into line and do as I was told. I, was, I told myself at the time it was normal and that if I didn't toe the line, then I would get found out. Um, as an imposter, let's say, because let's face it, I'd been in that company for 10 years at this point. I started, by the way, as a little grade two cashier on a really low income. And within 10 years, I'd worked my way up through that organization to get to a really senior place in senior management in a global corporate banking company. Um, and I was managing really large scale projects, you know, multi-million pound large scale projects. So surely someone was going to find me out someone was going to say, hang on a minute, this girl has not got the criteria, the, um, uh, the evidence, the experience, the capability to do these jobs. You know, I wasn't an academic at school. I, I got average to below average GCSE grades, and I just about scraped my A-levels, just about. Um, so I really spent, I felt like at the time, I'd really spent the last 10 years faking it, you know, when they say, you know, fake it till you make it. Um, or at least, at least that's what I believed at the time. That's what I believed. And then I guess um, there became a time where you could say that I learned some lessons because I'd matured, right? Age and experience, as we know, it brings wisdom. It brings clarity. It brings direction. It helps us to make wiser choices. It helps us to support who we are, believe in who we are, see who we are, and to be seen. And I really think that as we grow in experience and we grow and come of age, we uh, our values bubble up to the surface. And the more they bubble up to the surface, so do our morals and our principles. And we start to learn to stand firm and strong behind our truth. So wisdom does help us to find the courage and the strength in who we are and what we stand for. And I think it was at this time in my final job in the bank that lasted from 2014 to 2017, that the priority actually shifted and it became me. The priority became me. It was no longer about chasing the jobs, chasing the money, chasing the um, status. It just became I don't know if that's me or Steph. Have we lost Steph, Molly? Yeah, I think we have. Um... Okay. Not to worry, I'll, I'll, we'll wait for Steph to come back. I can, I can do a lot of talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I think, you know, what Steph was saying, actually, you know, when we look at ourselves talking about wisdom and what comes with wisdom, you know, we can sometimes look at obviously organisations and, and think that actually it's the organisation's problem. But actually, are we really, we're, we're all capable of moving. And I always like the quote, we're, you know, we're not a tree, we can move. Um, and it's really important, I think. Kelly, to... my back. Yeah, you're back. Okay. Right. Where did, um, Kelly, where did I get up to? Sorry, I don't know why so I cut out then. We, yeah, okay. So we're at wisdom. Uh, you're allowing yourself. We were talking about confidence. Lovely. Thank you very much. Where you are. Thank you very and much. You're Perfect. doing a great job, Steph. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's just pick up from where I was. So I was talking about this, the last choice, right? So from 2014 to 2017, I decided to switch jobs for the last time before I knew that I was going to be leaving the company. And um, the things that I realised that were really important to me was things like putting myself first, making sure that the experience was good, putting my values first, my beliefs first, and feeling supported, but most of all, surrounding myself with good people. OK, so surrounding myself with good people. And we had such a blast because I'd shifted the focus and shifted the dial on my thinking. 
really look at everything that had happened in the past and thought, I don't want to be in this space anymore. I want to be in a place where I can feel free, that I can grow. Moving into that role was the best thing that I ever did. And I didn't know at the time it was going to be the last job that I would do the company. But it was awesome. And the team were amazing. My boss was unreal. The opportunities were endless. And all because that I decided that at this time I would do what was right for me. So no more working for people I couldn't connect with that didn't have the same values. And frankly, that sometimes brought out the worst in me. And then the final thing that I just want to talk about on here is this. Um, I left the company in 2017 and there was a lot of soul searching for me. And I know that some of you on the on the screen today, you, you'll be thinking about where you left behind roles and responsibilities and careers and be moved into shaping your own company. Um, and you left that behind and you tried to make something new work. And it's, it's a really tough place to move into because depending on how long we've been with a company, we can be institutionalized. So we're really taking that leap of faith. So I've been institutionalized from 24 years old through to 41. So from, from girl to woman, right? I walked into that company really as a very immature 24 year old just out of uni and, and left there 17 years later. So you, the wisdom and the growth that you get within that, you can't be um, measured because you are really institutionalized. It's the only thing that you know. And I know that that will resonate with so many of us today. But women, I think, are resourceful. We are resilient. We have to deal with a lot in life and we have to carry a huge load. We can stand in our power, as I said earlier, stand in our truth and take that leap of faith in ourselves and our own abilities. Um, and we don't have to listen. This is the important part. We don't have to listen to the story of our life playing back loudly in our heads. All the stuff that's gone on. We don't have to listen to that. We can learn sure but we don't have to listen to it and often it's not even true that story that's playing back is not even true so now where am I I'm five years in to this new company five years from left from leaving the bank in 2017 and I still say that this company's in its infancy it really is five years feels like a lot but it's still in its infancy we're still evolving my experience is growing I've grown, you know, I'm growing. I know my craft very, very well now. And I know my business and I know where my strengths actually sit. So this is where I am now. You know, I am confident. I'm balanced. I understand others. I understand what I need. I'm a professional woman. And I am that today, I think, because of all the experience I've had in the past. And there's no doubt, no doubt in my mind whatsoever that they have shaped me in some way and supported me, importantly, to get to where I am today, too. So this is why I don't look back on these events with anger or sadness. I look at them with eyes of someone that's learned about who they are and who they want to be and where they want to go and how I move forward with, uh, with this company I work with, with wisdom and with hope and with freedom. So that's a bit about my story. But I want to um, just take us into looking a bit more about breaking the bias and um, this theme of International Women's Day. Now, I'm going to be really generic here, and um, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying what I'm about to say to cause offence, OK? But I'm going to be generic because it is still relevant in 2022 to point this stuff out. The stuff that's in the orange, caregiver, shoulder to cry on the children, run the house, I could go on and on and on and on, OK? And this is where I get generic, but it's still relevant. This is what I would describe as emotional labour, all right? The stuff that's in the orange. Having a lot of things to do a lot of things that are on your mind is having to remember to do the shopping, to label the kids PE kit, to get them up in the morning, to um, sort their breakfast out, get their lunches ready, get their uniforms on, find their backpacks, get their shoes ready, take them to school, do the after school meetings and all the after school clubs, go and see the teacher, pick them up where they're poorly. It's about picking them up at the end of the day, doing their tea, doing their homework, making sure they're happy, letting them play go on their PCs or whatever it is that they do, their gaming stations, putting them to bed with a story, making sure they're bathed and they're cleaned and their clothes and their, their stuff's ironed. That's just the kids, right? But then we're the caregivers. We're caregivers to others, to our friends, our family, to our parents if we still have them, and we're fortunate enough to still have them around, to our siblings, to our aunties, our uncles, our grandparents. We're the caregiver. We're also the shoulder to cry on. We're the person that somebody picks the phone up to and says, have you got a minute? I've got some stuff going on. I really, really need a help. I really need some help. I really need to talk to you. So we're also that person. We put stuff down to pick other people's stuff up all the time. And then we run the house. 
the bills, make sure the housework's done, the garden's tidy, the walls are painted, everything's clean. Um, we change the light bulbs, we uh, put the hoover around, we do the polishing, we make sure the washing's pegged out on a sunny day. The list is endless and I could put so much, so many more orange bowls on this page. Um, and and what, what is compounded on top of that is that when we ask for help, we have to really point out what that looks like. So could you go and buy a loaf of bread, please? And then that person comes back with the bread, but they haven't thought about, should I look to see if we need milk? Or could you put, could you buy some light bulbs? And then they buy the light bulbs, put them back on the dining table. But don't think, I wonder where that light bulb's needed. So we're car even carrying the instructions to others in order just to make uh, everything sort of tick over. Um, and this is, um, the reason I say it's generic, it's not to offend, but it's generic, but it's very, very relevant because this actually happens. And on top of that, in the white, women are trying to work and hold down probably these days a full time job, given the state of the economy. You know, we need as much uh, finance and income that we can generate as we can within the resources that we've got. Or for those on the screen, you're probably running a business or at least are a partner in running a business in some way. So I just want to kind of point that out. This emotional labour is huge. And as it says underneath, it's all unfolding faster than your nervous system can actually manage, which I'll get to later on. But really importantly, misunderstood assertiveness, and this is certainly for me something that I fell into in my 17, 18 years. And actually, I've got to tell you, I still fall into it now, both with men and with women. So if we try to get help, if we try to get support, if we ask people to do things for us, that, uh, that assertiveness can be really misunderstood. OK, and instead of it being seen as what it is, it's sometimes seen as aggressive. Now, aggressive behaviour is often interpreted differently in men than in women. In men, aggressive behaviour may be considered decisive or forceful or energetic or even ambitious or even leader like. But in women, the same behaviour may be viewed as hostile or even antagonistic or even belligerent. Um, but even assertive behaviour in women is misunderstood to be aggressive. Some of this bias is unconscious. We don't mean it. And that's woman to woman and also man to woman. It's not just about men and women together here. This is about women as well. So it can be really difficult to change. But just to be clear, being assertive is about showing confidence and standing up for our personal rights, who we are, being direct and being honest. Um, it's it's about being self-confident, it's about being positive, self-assured, it's about being firm, it's about being determined. And we can do all of that in a really gentle, compassionate and balanced way. We don't have to do it by rolling our sleeves up and elbowing our, elbowing our way through the crowd. And then there's being passive. So passive is about just accepting situations as they are. So the examples that I told you earlier, I accepted the situation as it was that I was given three months to turn a business around and then rated as underperforming. I accepted it was OK for a male boss to make a sexual pass at me. I accepted it was OK for a male boss to say to me, go and tell that woman that you need to give her this feedback, even though I didn't believe it. So that passive accepting can really cause us to feel quite discombobulated. And then aggression. Aggression is about pursuing our aims and our goals forcefully. As I said, rolling my sleeves up and elbowing my way through that crowd, no matter who I hurt. That's aggression. And it's about aiming for those goals in a forceful way, being really willing to attack. And that's a strong word, isn't it? Attack and confront and achieve them no matter what. So I want to talk to you a little bit about mindfulness and self-care and resilience and how to um, think about this in a way that it helps to balance the woman's load. And there's a, a lovely phrase that somebody I know um, said to me actually a little while ago, and it really hit home. The way that you do anything is the way that you do everything. The way that you do anything is the way that you do everything. And what this really means, is this is about habit and about being on autopilot. So our way of being transpires across all that we do, our way of being. And what mindfulness does is um, it helps us to get out of doing mode. So do, do, do all the time. Actions, ticking actions off the list, elbowing, elbowing our way through the crowd. And it pushes us into being mode. And just to be clear, mindfulness is not about sitting on a cushion for 30 minutes making um noises. So um, let's talk about the growth of mindfulness, understand it a little bit better and how to apply it. There's been a bit of a rise in 2017, from about 2017, in the volume of people taking this mindfulness, and then a real surge during the pandemic. And that's due to its accessibility, 
um, it, the fact it's a, a sort of secular approach. And of course, it has an impact on us. It can have an immediate impact. Now, due to modern science and changes in technology, mindfulness is now understood far better than ever before. And the link between living mindfully and mindfulness based interventions um, really does help us to understand the changes and the functionality of the brain and overall how that boosts our health and our well-being. And we can see the evidence of that through fMRI scanners, through the reduction in panic attacks scientifically and also um, anxiety attack measures. So um, through one to one work or through group work or even through um, employers, right, mindfulness has really become a popular go to therapy in, very much in Western society, um, except this time, this time it's not a fad. OK, there's so many fads, aren't there, out there, you know, fitness fads, well-being fads, diet fads. There are so many out there. This time it is not a fad. Mindfulness has been around for two and a half thousand years. So there's so much evidence to support it, particularly since um, the introduction of more technical based resources like fMRI scanners. Um, and then when we consider the woman's load, right, as discussed earlier and as I've talked about already, mindfulness can help us to feel really supported to develop self-compassion and a sense of non-judgmental awareness. So mindfulness can reduce that sound of our inner critic, all right? Turn that volume down just a little bit on that chatter and that rumination, which I know will resonate with so many of you today. And mindfulness is about, um, uh, mindfulness has been proven, should I say, to alleviate anxiety systems, uh, uh, symptoms and stress symptoms. Um, it boosts self-confidence and self-esteem for sure, and it can really help us to nurture this sense of calm in our lives um, and support us to develop a bit more of an ability to create space for us, space in our thinking, space in our ability to respond, uh, space in, in a physical sense, so create space between us and a problem, let's say, or an altercation of some sort, and also emotional space. Um, and there's a woman called Lena Horn, and some of you might have heard this quote. She says, it's not the load that breaks us. It's not the load that breaks us. It's how we carry it. OK, so mindfulness can help us to carry the load a lot better. Right. With more gentleness, with a sense of ease, a sense of compassion and without judging ourselves. So let's have a look at how we can break the bias and manage our load better um, in this much kind of stereotypical role that women play in modern society. So the first tool that I want to give you today is um, to break the circuit, right? And it starts like this. So this, this tool is called the stop coping mechanism, and it's a mindfulness based technique, but it's also um, a cognitive behavioral therapy technique. And it helps us to break the circuit in a moment of stress and helps us to build resilience in that moment. Now, when we react, to stress, the downstream impact of the reaction can be quite a lot of suffering. So I'll give you an example. Someone says something to me, I react to what they say, and then afterwards what happens? I feel a bit guilty. I start saying things like, I really didn't mean it. It wasn't supposed to come out that way. I'm sorry that I said that. And then what happens after that? I carry that with me for the rest of the day, the guilt, the anxiety you know, that turbulation of kind of, oh, what did I do? What did I say? So this technique is about breaking that circuit. If you're somebody that works at a keyboard a lot and you might be working with somebody that's quite challenging or difficult, I'm sure most of us have done this, that moment when we write an email and we send it and we don't think about the consequences of sending it, this will help break that circuit. So think of this as a technique that helps to break that circuit between reacting to something versus responding to something. And um, for anybody that's interested in this, I put out a video today on LinkedIn about a very similar technique and some theory around that. So um, we are going to stop first is the first thing we're going to do. The second thing we're going to do is take a breath. The third is we observe what is happening and then we proceed with insight. So imagine that moment of stress rising. The first thing we do is stop. The second thing we, that we do is we take a breath. And all that means is you watch the breath come in or watch it come out. And you just do that two or three times, in and out. Now the breath is the thing that's creating the space, that moment for you in time. Now the observe is the most important thing. The O in observe, so S-T-O-P, stop, T for take a breath, O to observe, P 
P to proceed is a really easy way to remember it. The O is about what is happening right here, right now. So what's happening in my body? If I'm stressed, I'm going to be tight jawed, tight shouldered, probably a bit of stomach, something going on there. I might be heart really beating. I might feel a sense of heat in my body, agitation. OK, that's the physical sense. What's going on for me in my thoughts? So my thoughts might be, I can't believe you just done that to me. I can't believe you just said that. Who the hell do you think you are? Right. Thoughts are racing. And then the emotions are anger, frustration, sad, whatever it is that, that correlates with this specific moment that you're trying to break the circuit on. If we observe those three things that are going on for us, thoughts, feelings and physical sensations, we are much more likely to proceed through that insight in a way that is more helpful and will cause us less suffering as a downstream impact. OK, so um, having a think about that, one of the things that you can do is get a post-it note and write STOP down the side and then stop, take a breath, observe and proceed. And then put that post-it note in a place somewhere that you know you always get triggered. OK, could be the kitchen in the mornings because it's a bit of a rush. It might be on your laptop for work because you're there all the time and it's so stressful. OK, so stop, take a breath, observe and proceed to break the circuit of stress. Now, the second thing I just want to talk about is something called daily pages. OK, I've been doing this for a long time. And for anybody that knows this, this uh, writer, a woman called Julia Cameron, she wrote a book called The Artist's Way amongst, she's wrote, written 66 books, so it's one of her 66. Daily Pages is about journaling, and I wonder how many of you already do that. The difference though, is I journaled for a long time, and I've switched to Daily Pages uh, probably about a month ago now. And um, Daily Pages is about allowing the pen to run across the page with whatever's coming up in your mind, first thing in the morning so this is what it looks like for me my alarm goes off I get up I go for a wee come back drink my glass of water that's there grab my book and I write two daily pages and I just allow the pen to write whatever's in my mind whatever is there now what that helps us to do is a number of things really it helps us to realize what's going on in the psyche the moment that we wake up okay and that can be so useful because if we don't pay attention to it, what can actually happen is a lot of that stuff starts to unfold in our worry and our rumination and our anxieties and our stresses throughout the day. But the other thing that it can do is over time, when you get into this practice of two daily pages first thing in the morning, it actually helps us to unlock a more creative side. And I am evidence of that. I'm evidence of that. As I said, I've been journaling a long time and I find journaling to be more reflective of what's gone on in the day. Daily pages is much more about where I am right now. And what that does is it opens up so many doorways to creativity. I can't tell you. It's been fascinating. So daily pages is something we can do. It takes me probably somewhere between seven to ten minutes. Um, and as I said, I just sit there with the covers still first thing in the morning, writing these two daily pages. But there's no agenda. You haven't got to get up and think, what am I writing about today? It's just about letting the pen do, do its work. Whatever's in your brain, it comes down on the page. And it doesn't even matter if it doesn't make sense. OK, so that's the second thing. And then the third thing that I just want to talk to you about is getting out of your head and into your body. Now, the reason I talk about this, this is one of my most passionate things to talk about, because in modern society, we have so many distractions. We are stuck in our heads 95, 97, 98 percent of the time. And what I mean is it's almost like this is where we exist just here. And from here down, that is completely cut off from the rest of what's going on up here. So we're so controlled and so consumed by our thoughts that we feel like the only part of our living being is our head. And that's because none of this has got any sensitivity to it. Unless, of course, we burn our hands or we cut a finger or we pull a muscle. Then there's sensitivity because the body's sending you that signals, those signals. But body based techniques can really help us to get out of our head, back into the body, quieten down that rumination and that voice that consistently badgers us. You know, the stuff from the past, the stuff from the future, the worry, the anxiety, getting out of the head and getting into the body. And these are the benefits. Right. So quietening down the volume of chatter, 
using the body as an anchor so a place to go right here's my body here it is what's going on helps us to reduce stress living in the moment because the body is always the thing that tells you the truth and i'll come back to that in a second it helps us to avoid time travel because if we're out of our head and we're in our body we're in the moment if we're in our head we're thinking about the past or the future we're never really thinking about the moment that we're in we can build attention and awareness of our physical experiences. And what this means is, to, is, is embodiment, embodiment. So many of us are cut off, as I've said, embody what's going on there. And then we can engage the parasympathetic nervous system, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, just before we finish. There's a guy that I really love reading about. His name's Jack Cornfield, and he's a notary writer and a mindfulness teacher. And he talks about embodiment in this way. He says that the body always tells you the truth. The mind, however, it plays tricks on us. It's a time traveling capsule that takes us into the past and into the future. And then guess what it does? It tells us to believe what's there. The mind tells us tales. It lies to us all the time. So thoughts are not factual. They are not factual. They are rumination. They're storytelling, stuff that we get caught up in. OK, so um, the body always tells you the truth. And I'm going to prove that to you right now. I'd like everyone to just take a space with their hands and place them in front of their heads, heads like this. And on the count of three, we're going to clap. So I'm going to say one, two, three, and then we're going to clap. One, two, three. Notice how your hands feel. What's going on there for you in your hands? Do it again. One, two, three. Notice how your hands feel. What's going on in your hands? Are they tingling? Is there some sensation there? Maybe a feeling of warmth or pins and needles. As you hold your hands up, what do you notice about your arms and shoulders? What's going on for you in the back of your neck? And relax. There's my point. The body tells the truth. So if you can find ways to get out of your head, and get into your body, you are going to reduce stress, anxiety, rumination, mind chatter, and it will really help you to feel supported and to nurture that sense of awareness of what is real versus, versus what is not real. You know, those thoughts in the past, the thoughts of the future, the stuff that we get caught up in that just causes us to feel um, overwhelmed, right? So the final thing I want to share with you is a little bit of science, um, and this is just to kind of highlight i guess why mindfulness is good for us and when i say why is mindfulness good for us remember what i said earlier let's not get caught up with thinking that mindfulness is about sitting on a cushion quietly for long periods of time it isn't okay i said to you earlier at the beginning of the session that i have this huge ambition to modernize mindfulness to make it really relevant and relatable for people so that they can build it in in a very natural way to their day-to-day -day lives and then notice the benefits because the benefits are huge. So um, this is a very basic it's kind of room 101, uh, um, autonomic nervous system, neuroscience uh, theory. Um, so we all have an autonomic nervous system in our bodies and we have two branches that come off of that autonomic nervous system. One is the sympathetic nervous system and the other is the parasympathetic nervous system. OK, now you'll a lot of you will know the phrase fight and flight. OK, you'll have heard of that. Now, the sympathetic nervous system is the nervous system that um, has that fight and flight mechanism. OK, so what that means is, is that when we're stressed, if I take you back, let's take you back to um, maybe a good couple of hundred, maybe a thousand years ago, a million years ago. When man and woman used to stand on the savannah in their loincloths, so just picture that for a moment, they would look out for threat on the horizon. And the threat at that time would have been a woolly mammoth or a saber-toothed tiger. And if they'd seen that in the distance, they would have gone into fight and flight and their sympathetic ner nervous system would have engaged, okay? It would have ignited in some way. And they would have made the choice, do I stand and fight this animal so that I can feed and clothe my family or do I leg it? And the evolution of man obviously tells us that we survived. So they learned that they probably couldn't fight on their own. They legged it instead to safety. The interesting thing now, though, is there's a part of the brain called the amygdala. 
and the amygdala is the oldest part of the lizard brain and it hasn't evolved since those days back where man woman stood with a loincloth looking out of the savannas and it hasn't evolved so it doesn't now understand modern threat and the difference between a perceived threat or a real threat so when you get a meeting that's put in your diary from somebody that is if you're in a hierarchical system it might be a boss or a leader that says um meeting with Mr X my boss um at this time and there's no agenda but an email that says I need to talk to you Steph what happens is because this part of our brain the amygdala doesn't understand the difference between perceived threat and a real threat is it pushes us into fight and flight and it engages that sympathetic nervous system now when the sympathetic nervous system is engaged a lot of things happen our pupils fix and dilate our blood pressure increases our heart rate increases our bone structure skeletal structure hardens and the muscles the wall of our muscles harden as well as almost if we're getting ready for an impact or a threat to our bodies our um, digestive system um, slows down and, and that's why when we're stressed we get can get quite bad stomach ache or constipation um, and our um, chemical reaction in the body with the sympathetic nervous system and fight and flight pushes into the release of adrenaline and cortisol which are the stress hormones so that all of that happens from an email that says i need to have a conversation with you now we have no idea what that conversation is going to be about but the stories in our heads like i told you go to a place of in the past last time that happened to me i got told off for something or we pretend that we can time travel and we guess we go oh it must be about that piece of work yeah it's got to be about that i must have done something wrong right so this comes up in so many scenarios but the challenge here is that way back when man and woman stood on the savannas with their loincloths um, this was a useful system in our brain because it really helped us to decipher between a real threat um, and um, a potential threat or, or, or a perceived threat because what was standing in front of us that woolly mammoth or that saber-toothed tiger was a real threat so fight and flight was a real thing and we would leg it and we would um, look after ourselves the difference today though is that the threat that is pushing ourselves into sympathetic is not a real threat so where mindfulness comes in is that through different techniques and resources and skills and tools that we teach we can learn to engage the parasympathetic nervous system which is our rest and digest system and i always find this so interesting because many of you will have heard of fight and flight i would say a minority would know about rest and digest so mindfulness helps us to push ourselves into parasympathetic nervous system rest and digest by calling on a number of techniques a number of um, tools and resources that we have in our armory that can help to support us and therefore alleviate stress symptoms and, and and move away from feeling feeling that sense of anxiousness or anxiety and that's because when we practice mindfulness based techniques we're able to call the fires of stress and we reverse out from adrenaline and cortisol and we exchange that up through mindfulness techniques for uh, chemicals like endorphins, dopamine and serotonin, natural chemicals in the body that are related to feeling good, the feel good factor. OK, so um, you can really see the difference between the two, but the health benefits of being in rest and digest far outweigh. Obviously, there are no health benefits from being through fight and flight, but the health benefits from being in rest and digest are significant. OK. Um, in, certainly uh, health health, um, health and well-being will, will be better overall in a more general sense but you will be able to concentrate more and focus better you would be able to feel that sense of being able to respond to situations rather than react therefore that downstream impact of um, stresses not continuing to cause us guilt and shame and problems later on down the track um, you certainly become a better listener you certainly are able to respond to stress in a way that's more helpful um, you can call those fires of stress. And as I said, you can engage the parasympathetic nervous system and bring about those chemicals that help us to feel better about ourselves and more connected to life. So there's so many benefits within the use, the use of the rest and digest system. And just before I finish, I just want to make sure and be really clear with all of you that the fight and flight system, the sympathetic nervous system, when we need it, we can call on it and it's there. So mindfulness is not about pushing that system away completely. It's about using it when the time is right. 
It's about using it when we really need it. OK, so fight and flight is important. And when we are in that that space of stress and um, heightened stress, we call on that fight and flight system in a very natural way and it helps to support us. What I'm saying here is that in this modern day that we're in, due to all of the distractions and things that go on around us and due to our woman's load, right, particularly or the load of life, we are so much more in fight and flight than we need to be. So we use mindfulness to take us out of that and re-engage in the parasympathetic nervous system, calling the fires of stress and giving us that space and that freedom to choose who we want to be in the moment. So that's me. Um, I am going to pause there. Um, I'm just going to bring up a slide for you to see. These are my contact details, should anybody want it. And um, a nifty little QR code that if you scan it with your phone, it takes you straight to LinkedIn. So it just saves you looking me up. So you can scan that with your camera on your, um, on your phones, on your smartphones, and that will take you straight to my LinkedIn profile. So I'll leave it there just for a second. And I know that uh, Kelly said earlier that it would be useful to have a few moments for Q&A and then you've got this half an hour of, of networking. Um, so we've probably got about 10 minutes actually where if you wanted to, we can just share some questions or some thoughts. And I can also see the chat has got 20 comments in it. Some probably telling me that you can't hear me. Um, so I'll have a look at those too. Yeah, Thanks, um, thank, thank you ever so much, Steph. Thank you very much. That was really informative. Um, and you know there there are some really valuable questions actually. Um, I think I think like just to round up for what you've spoken about, you know, I I, put up, I I'm a trained counsellor. I've done a lot of self development. I work on myself regularly. I think you know what you were saying is absolutely correct to use the tools because our mind lies to us. I know every morning I wake up, I do a gratitude list, I meditate in the evening. Um, you know I. I journal, like, journal right before I go to bed. And these are all ways and things I use to be able to silence my mind so that I can kind of sift through the rubbish, if you like, yeah. <laughs> to the nitty gritty good stuff. Because, of course, sometimes we do need to change, don't we? Sometimes to grow and to develop ourselves as beings, we do need to, to change. Yeah, um, totally. and, that does, and it needs a certain confidence, doesn't it, to do that? So thank you once again. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. We've got qu some questions. So sure. um, I'm going to go to the uh, just one here. So um, what's the typical age for your clients? Mm. And um, are there a certain are there certain age groups to work with that are better? You know, do you, what, what's your kind of peak age that you find? Yes, yeah, so it's if it's individual clients, um, it's a mixture, really. Uh, what I'm really pleased to report is that I'm getting a lot more men, which is actually really good to see. So men are being uh, becoming a lot more open about talking about themselves and their challenges and particularly around the psychological piece. Um, there's two particular demographics that I get um, probably more referrals for than any. One is, uh, and again, very, this is really good to hear, I think, and for you to know, is young people. So people aged between around sort of 19 and 25 are actually stepping forward now and looking for help. And I think that's really refreshing. And then the second group is men and women between the ages of 45, uh, between the ages of 40 and 60. Women, particularly when they're going through menopause, uh, when you know things can be really challenging um, they're carrying the woman's load and then they've got the menopause to deal with on top of that you know the, the menopause does all sorts of things to us doesn't it in terms of our values beliefs behaviors and where we want to be in life yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah so I would say uh, predominantly there um, in the workplace um, it's it's you know really most organizations that I work with aren't it's not mandated it's voluntary and um, people that step forward for mindfulness based um, interventions is very very mixed very mixed um you know literally from the person that's been in the organization for the least amount of time and is the youngest through to the person that's been in the organization for the longest amount of time and is maybe one of the, the one of the older uh, employees yeah really yeah. mixed and also i mean feminism let's talk about feminism right so feminism has a big a big you know some people think feminism is the way to push women's rights i'm my own personal belief has always believed that I am not striving ever for equality. I'm quite happy knowing that a man and a woman is different. We have different values. We have we have a different purpose. You know, I, I've never understood us like women perhaps trying to be the same as a man. Yeah. Um, I, I very much believe we're very different. We hold different skills and that's what we should be appreciated for. Yeah. And they're both needed. Um, so, you know, let's talk about that. How did women become the provider of everything? You know, 
perhaps feminism has taken us to a, a movement that actually what's happened is rather than women uh, shedding responsibility, we've actually gained more. <laughs> I think I think there's a thing about I do think there's a thing about the woman's load and what we actually bring upon ourselves. There's mm. something about nature nurture in life where we oh, I have to say, I think women do enjoy some of it where they like to surround themselves with um, responsibility and, you know, think that they're really required. You know, they're this commodity that's really required and, you know, they're really resourceful. And and I also think that, you know, women have got this kind of um, uh this this sense of being able to multitask I mean it comes up all the time to me oh yeah women can multitask I thought women could multitask conversation I get caught up in and I think we we become it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy you know it's like we become um what we perceive to be expected of us but actually I wonder at sometimes if it is actually expected of us and there's just this you know when I was talking earlier about subs being subservient if yeah. we were just able to ask the question and ask for support and maybe in the early days it might be that we've got to ask for the support we've got to be really clear about what it is that we need and try not to cross over into aggressive aggression but stay in assertion yeah. so um, I think some of it is about you know it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy is that we we sometimes cause this for ourselves and if we were to be more balanced more think about that equanimity you know being on a balanced balance in a balanced space with men and women or partners it doesn't matter if you've got a female partner or a male partner you know I think um there, there, there always tends to be dominance somewhere um and, and if it's about the woman's load you know really thinking about is this something that we're bringing on ourselves or should we could we could we learn to have more open uh, compassionate um balanced conversations that might take us to a different place absolutely Steph. and that is something i was just about to say it's the art of asking open questions like asking open questions you know um could could you tell me could you tell me your thoughts on that or you know i think sometimes we can close we can ask closed questions and then it doesn't give you know then you get this mindset where you're it's you're perceiving you're perceiving things from your own experience yeah. rather than actually listening to what might be presented to you in front of you yeah and, and i and i also think kelly as well and to everybody i think some of this has got to do with listening yeah. Right. So we're not we're not the best listeners in terms of people. I'm not talking about women. None of us are, are great listeners unless we've trained ourselves to be really good listeners. It does take practice. And one of the exercises that I talk about all the time and demonstrate is um, to next time you have a conversation, see if you can listen to someone until they stop talking mm. rather than interject and, and do two or three things. Notice how that feels in your body to do that. And, and notice the urges that are coming up. So uh, I'll give you a, for instance, if somebody talks to me about paddleboarding and it's something I absolutely love, they'll talk to me about paddleboarding and, and, and immediately I will be need to be really mindful about not interrupting them because I want to know what paddleboard did you got? How much did you get? How much did it cost? Where do you go? What time of the year? Have you got a wetsuit? So I want to know all of these answers that are on my agenda. But because of my training, I'm able to sit back and just listen and just hear what's coming up and I try do try to be really mindful in those conversations and allow that person to finish what they're saying right to the end and then respond rather than react to what's being said even though my reaction is coming from a good excited place you know but what we find is that when we when we're in a in a conversation and something's coming up that's triggering us whether it's excitement or whether it's um worry or stress or anxiety we interject and I think if we were able to listen until that person finishes talking as much as we possibly can, we would learn so much more about them and so much more about ourselves. And that's where the space is made and the freedom to be able to have conversations that can be so much more helpful for us. Absolutely. And it breeds creativity. It really it does. does. This, this, yeah. this really breeds creativity, yeah. which is obviously valuable for any woman, any man in business. You know, creative thinking is what makes separates you as an individual to others. Mm -hmm. um, and we've all, we've all got our purpose. You know, none of us are the same. We might have characteristics the same, behaviours the same, but actually we're all very fundamentally different. Um, so, yeah, Steph, thank you so much. Um, no it's been wonderful. Somebody has just asked. Let's just... Um, ask um have you got a couple of books that you could recommend i'm sure you have yeah i was trying to type them while you were talking kelly and then realized my caps lock was on it wasn't neat enough for me because i'm such a perfectionist so um yeah so there's a couple of books i'd recommend and um, first one would be um finding peace in a frantic world 
And that's by um, Dan Penman and Mark Williams, Finding Peace in a Frantic World. Um, and that's a really great introduction to um, in, introducing mindful based living into day to day life. Um, if you want to go a bit deeper than that, I'm reading a I mean, I'm actually leading a book group at the moment, which I absolutely love. Once a month we meet and um, it's probably something I'm going to carry on doing. Um, but, yeah, there's a book that we're reading at the moment, which is a bit deeper. And it's more about the connection of um, human beings. And it's called um, Boundless Heart. And it's by a woman called Christine. Feldman, it's, I think it's Christine with a C. So Christine Feldman, F-E-L-D-M-A-N, Boundless Heart. And just to be clear on that one, Boundless Heart is about what it says on the tin. It's about the, the depth and the breadth of our hearts and how when we find space in our ability to communicate, we can become absolutely um, in awe of what is there in awe of what is there, men and women alike, you know, and it's just about the art of communication and being able to sense into what each other's needs are. And it's not just about those that we know, but it's also about those that we don't know. So having a boundless heart for people that come into our life and leave and we barely know who they are, but also having a boundless heart for maybe others that might be in crisis, which I know will be on a lot of our minds at the moment um, and really sending well wishes to those two. So yeah, so two books, two books there. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Steph. OK, so we are into our first breakout room. Um, please do share the time nicely um, because everybody would like the time. You know, we, let's, I, I like to make sure that we all get a chance to speak. Um, Steph, if, if you're happy to go into a breakout yeah. room, too, uh, that'd be wonderful. Uh, and I'll see you back in 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs>